Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Digital Artcast. Um, once again, coming at you with another great episode. Um, I'm hoping you guys out there in Artland are dealing with the uncertain times that we face at the moment um, and everything that's going on in the world. Again, um, like I say over the last couple of episodes, I hope you guys are staying safe and making sure that you are keeping productive. Um, and I can only hope that these episodes are in some small way helping uh, extend the life of your sanity while we are in lockdown. Um, again, yeah, it's been a, a really trying time. I've tried to get um, a lot more guests on the, on the podcast in the last couple of weeks, months. Um, to try and fill up that void of people spending so much time at home. Um, our guest today, again, is, is an epic one, one that I've been trying to get on for a while. Um, and the work that this artist done has jumped out at me um, about a year ago, um, and I was following their career uh, as it went. And now uh, their career has exploded again into amazing new things just recently. And I thought it was a good time to come on and talk about uh, their career, their past, um, how they got into art, and then everything in between. Um, so today, um, I would like to introduce um, another amazing guest on the podcast, uh, Miss Hannah Watts. Hey, Hannah. Hello. Thank you for having me. You are quite welcome. Um, yeah, so we were just kind of uh, diving in and out before we started recording about you know bits and pieces of your life. But uh, for people who don't particularly know you or know your work at the moment um can you give a quick intro on who you are and what you do sure so yeah my name is hannah watts and i'm currently a senior prop artist at uh, reflections uh, ubisoft reflections which is in the northeast of newcastle wait no northeast of england rather <laughs> <laughs> roughly i mean yeah probably the people always get mixed up uh, when i tell them from scotland where that is so it's uh it's always uh, it's always an interesting thing try to describe the uk to some people but uh yeah, yeah, Ubisoft is a good studio. And then again, because uh, I haven't kind of said it officially, but congratulations on your latest uh, advancement in the industry. That was a, a big, big step that, that you took uh, recently. So I hope that's been uh, uh, exciting and, and, and different. And it's been, you know, educating you and, and, and filling you with, uh, well, I mean, I say that, again, we talked about that beforehand with, with the, the whole lockdown situation. But again, it's, it's still a great accolade in your career regardless. But um, yeah, I hope that's been... I hope it's been exciting anyway. I hope yeah, it's been, it's, it's been wonderful. It's kind of been everything I hoped. Um, obviously, yeah, the the lockdown situation, I'm sure, is strange for everyone. Um, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I can only speak highly of like Ubisoft's onboarding. Um, yeah. And the efforts that they put to, like, get me involved with the team. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, obviously, like, working from home sometimes has its ups and downs. Like, you are kind of in the same room. Um, yeah. But for the most part, it's, yeah. it's been pretty good. Yeah, awesome. And then, of course, looking back in your career and, and your past, uh, I noticed that there was, I say something that ties us together, but mostly just the fact that you studied in Dundee, right, in Scotland. So, I did, uh, the other northeast, yeah. Yes, the other, <laughs> yes, indeed, yes, yeah. The place even we avoid, no, I'm only joking. Uh, no, like uh, Dundee, yeah, Aberteen itself has borne a legacy of game developers up and down Scotland. I mean, of course, if people don't know, it's where a lot originally, the, the a lot of the guys who are now, kind of big guys in Rockstar North originated and then DMA was formed up there and um, just a, like a whole history of games development in Scotland exists up in, in Dundee and um, was that a conscious effort to study because you knew about its past or was that because at the time where you're from in Newcastle there wasn't as much uh, games development courses there? Well I'm actually from Liverpool so I'm not I'm not a Geordie oh, okay. here um, yeah. but uh yeah, I actually didn't know where Dundee was. I just picked it because it was a skill set accredited course. Uh, I don't know if skill set still exists, but it basically meant that there was like a board of advisors that would kind of certify games courses in the UK. And I think that at the time, this was 2010, um, there was only, I think, five in the UK. So I know Bournemouth was one, uh, Teesside was mm-hmm. the other, which I was obviously right. in uh, near Newcastle. And then uh, Dundee, I remember... Um, and yeah so I just kind of put them all on my applications and my parents wanted to murder me because they had to drive (laughs) I didn't know where Dundee was I was just like yeah whatever let's go there um and (laughs) yeah my parents are not too happy about having to drive like six hours on their weekend um but yeah um it's it's funny because like to to go to Dundee it's um 
in the nicest way possible, quite an unassuming place. It's it's quite small for a city. Um, it's very pretty though, beautiful architecture. I, it's, uh, yeah. I thought anyway, yeah. but um, you wouldn't look at it and think like you know tech or games powerhouse. You know, you'd think that right. like Silicon Valley or maybe like yeah. Manchester, but um, yeah, but yeah, it's like quite a little hidden gem. Yeah, I think if you don't know the the like the history I talked about with DMA and Rockstar, like you would not really like draw yourself to it because I think since then there hasn't been, you know, I mean there's been people who've left there and had successful careers, of course, but at the same time, you know, um, it's probably not one of the better known universities in the UK when it comes to game development. Um, like I mean I know there's a ton down south, even in London, like there's is it Escape I think now that's running in there where Escape, like yeah, uh, I think De Montfort has quite a good rep. Um, right. Bournemouth has kind of stayed as, with a good rep as has Teesside um, right yeah so I mean there's there's multiple down in England but I think Scotland lacks any major players up in that scale anyway I know that I think Glasgow in itself is, is kind of uh, Glasgow Caledonia is, is slightly building um, but then uh, Dundee I think is just it's the sleeping giant up in Scotland that not like I said you wouldn't, look, you wouldn't think to look at it how uh, tech heavy the, the university is in Dundee but it is it is extremely, I think, uh, yeah, well equipped for for what they do. So, okay. so were you, yeah. So, were you? Uh, was it specifically three D you went to study there? Actually, no. I wanted to be an animator. So okay. Yeah. I, um, well, actually, originally I was going to go and do medicine. Um, oh god. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, it was because I was in that like you know that gifted and talented cohort thing that the schools had. I don't know. Again, I don't know if they still have it. Um, right. But it was very much expected that um anyone that was in that would you know go into one of the sciences right. uh, it would obviously look good on the school to have those kind of um university rates okay um and yeah i, I actually went i went on a day trip because the a levels that i picked were all science apart from i was adamant that i was keeping art right. um and it's a good thing i did because i actually went on an art age uh, on an art day trip and mm -hmm. there was, um, it was like a University of Lancashire and mm -hmm. it was to look at ceramics or something. And there was a sign right. that said game design workshop. And I, at the time was a massive Guild Wars player. In fact, I'd actually got in trouble with my attendance at school because I was playing too much <laughs> Guild Wars. Um, nice. And I snuck off uh, away from my class. who didn't notice me gone, which is super safe. Um, but uh, yeah, I basically snuck into this class and I asked if I could sit in and it was meant to be, um, fully but you you meant to book in advance but they just right. like, they let me sit in and they uh actually the you know props to the uh lecturers there they kind of took me around by myself and like showed me all the work on the walls and talked about the course and stuff and that's when I first realized that games could be a career and I was like yeah I don't want to do medicine anymore so I went home redid my cover letter for getting into uni uh my parents were a little bit confused I wouldn't say disappointed but they just mm -hmm. didn't quite get it at first um okay and then yeah just never looked back it kind of all fell into place after that I suppose I was going to say it'd be an interesting path you would have taken if you'd went into medicine around this time especially <laughs> that well, would have been, it's actually yeah. funny you say that because this is completely off topic but um my my best friend Steph um we were going to go and do medicine together at Liverpool um, right and she I think only graduated like a year or two ago and yeah she's been, <gasps> she's been working the front lines um, this oh, summer. God. Yeah. So if you've been out clapping for her every Thursday, then you've been out cheering <laughs> her on. Yeah. I've, I've given a little clap, yeah. Yeah, of course. No, like a, a, a large percentage of my family are nurses. So it's uh, it's also a, a weary time for a lot of people. Either that or um, like my mum also was a, a carer as well. Uh, luckily, she retired uh, just over a year ago. So probably i mean exactly what you know she probably should have done but then at the same time it was it was very close to what was happening so yeah a lot of people i know are in medical fields or in care so it's it's been um it's been an interesting time also my partner's mum is a carer and her brother is a doctor so oh wow really surrounded by medics then yeah indeed well they're, they're over in uh holland because she's from um uh netherlands so uh yeah they're across there but then uh yeah the whole world's been feeling it but yeah it's been a, a scary time a scary time anyway so uh so yeah so you've done the whole extensive day trip you were kind of applying you wanted to do it so where i suppose was the switch during that time you know because you were doing animation or you had your hat set in it that you then switched to 3d or did that happen post-university um so 
I'd say in maybe the first, so obviously uh, Scottish courses are four years as opposed to the right. three at England. Um, yeah. So in my, I'd say maybe halfway through my second year, I, I realized that I just hated animation. We'd done like the foundations of it um, with like the, right. the post-its and uh improving your 2d fundamentals and stuff and uh-huh. i didn't mind them so much but then when we got into maya in second year i just it was far too finicky for me i just i hated it i just wasn't interested i didn't right i didn't like all the stuff with the keyframes um and right. i actually didn't know what i wanted to do for probably probably about a year and a half i was i was mostly doing 2d stuff because i came from a fine art background and it was it was easy to get my grades if I did 2D projects for my coursework. Um, right. And then it was actually in my final year the, uh, after doing Dare to be Digital. Uh, so I'm, I met a bunch of students from Teesside Uni who were doing a 3D game. And I was like amazed that they could do like these 3D assets as quick as they could. Cause we hadn't really, we hadn't had much 3D instruction. And the stuff that we had done was like in Maya and it was meant to be like, um, it was like offline rendering um, and it didn't really go into into much detail. So I, I'd, I'd say I, I pretty much had no 3D education up to that point. Um, and I was just amazed how quickly they were making assets for like a, you know, Dare to be Digital runs for six weeks, um, right. like a game in that amount of time. Um, and I, yeah. I asked one of them for instruction, basically, and um, he taught me quite a lot of stuff, like a lot of basics about 3DS Max. Right. Um, and then, yeah, my, that's when I decided, like, my final year, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an environment artist. And I, I, yeah, I, I just did not come out of my room for about a year and just kind of powered through. And this, this was uh, the year before, oh, I think it was the year that Unreal Engine had come out, or just the year, oh, it was just before. So it was right. kind of at the end of UDK's life cycle. Right. Okay. So, yeah, that was yeah, a okay. fun engine to tackle with. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, like, because I think that's one of the one of the bigger points when it comes to environment art and people getting into that industry is that they always feel that I think it no, I think it's the same in any industry, any discipline, but they feel like there's so much to learn. You know, there's like you know, you've got your modeling software, you've got texturing, you've got real time stuff to think about game engines. So, how do you feel like you prep for that, or how did you break that down? Did you focus on maybe just one skill set specifically at a time, and then just build on top of that? Um, I'm trying to remember. It's like I'm six, thinking like, did you do more of like, yeah, like just pure modeling first, and then you yeah, eventually like I, right. Yeah. So I could already model all right. Um, right. Obviously, it looking back, like compared to now, it wasn't all right. But you know, I could I could model ish. Um, it was the baking of normal maps. Um, because so yeah, at uni we'd only been taught uh, bump maps. So right. learning about like specular. Uh, obviously, this was like again just like a year before pbr kind of came out so it was like Mm -hmm. um learning about normal maps and specular uh, and emissive maps just like blew my mind so then with that i kind of plugged in the the painting that i'd been doing for the last couple years so my my final year project was very stylized um so yeah and yeah the technical stuff that i just i i didn't get it at first and I'd right. say for even a couple of years after uni, I really struggled with knowing where to look as well. And I, right. I struggled to teach myself as well. I think as I've got older, it gets easier to, and you've got more of a collective knowledge. It does get easier to teach yourself the more technical side of things. Um, right. I guess I was just fortunate that I had more of like a creative, an art background, so I could kind of fudge my way towards something that... Um, you know, the stylization of it can distract from the technical shortcomings. In some yeah. Ways. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's something that I've been going through recently where, you know, I've definitely spent, I mean, I graduated in 2018 um, um, and that was like a highlight because I was one of the few people in my family to go to university. So that in Excel was like a great success for me. And then of course the podcast was doing well, but then with art, it's always been a thing where, I'm a very kinesthetic learner where I tend to generally learn by doing or watching people doing and they're replicating. Um, but then I think a lot of this industry and so much of it initially is you have to learn by yourself. You have to be self-motivating. You have to be somebody who wants to develop those skills outside of a studio before you go into that. 
So I think that's been one of my biggest struggles, and I'm actually glad you talked about it, where you had this time where you were a bit lost or you were struggling a little bit to teach yourself certain things, because I think that's maybe one point that people don't talk enough about when, like, it is very hard, it is very difficult. People almost, I think, there were some lectures especially that came to my university at the time towards my third year where they were talking about, like, oh, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to get in the industry, you just have to work hard, you just have to do, you know, but I was almost wanting them to say like well it isn't easy like it is very hard it's very difficult it's going to be you know your motivation will be low you're really going to struggle to get up sometimes and teach yourself stuff but you've got to do it so I think it's a point you bring up that I think would resonate more with my listeners especially because I know a lot of them also struggle with self-motivation was it something where I don't know what to say it in a way that you know you just had to get it done but was that the case that you just thought like I need to just force myself to learn um It is now. I'd say that I still have a little bit of like a hangover in my personality Mm -hmm. or psyche or whatever you want to call it from that time. Um, I can, I do have a natural reversion to look like if I'm looking at like a really long tutorial that's, you know, that's purely technical or, you know, a breakdown, I can, my knee jerk reaction is to be like, I can't do it instantly. Um, Right. And I think that does come from, uh, maybe like being a bit like that in my formative years right and I've got to that point now as I've got older um where that's I can push that voice like down like to the back of my head and just be like just do it just get to your pc and at least open the program and then yeah. see where you go um yeah and that's actually I've I've been doing that more in lockdown uh so there was, um, I don't know if you saw, like I was experimenting with Marvelous Designer uh, towards the, the start of lockdown. And that was right. something that um, I've never done a huge amount of cloth sim before. Uh, I've used like a little bit of 3 ds Maxis tools, but they're, they're not amazing. Um, right. And I've obviously seen all these artists do all these like fancy garments. And, you know, that is mm-hmm. in some ways it's primary usage. And so I'd convinced myself it was like, it was too impossible for me to learn it all. And this was only right. like what? four or five months ago um and in so basically i watched a flipped normals like crash course tutorial and i think it's just Mm -hmm. free on their youtube and um within the night within that same night um i'd already got like the base the base of my curtains done right and it's it's just a small step it's like oh it's curtains great but um it was enough to just learn the hotkeys and the logic behind the program and as soon as i'd got over that first hurdle I was fine and also my you know I still struggle with marvelous a little bit sometimes but failing that first time or rather getting over that hurdle the first time is nowhere near oh sorry it's way more intimidating than like I forget a a key now or it's like a small bit I don't know how to do right like breaking the ice essentially no of course I think it's also interesting when you talk about that you know pushing that voice down in your head because I think sometimes that voice is very hard to push down it's almost like I mean, I watched a, funny enough, I was on, I, I mean, this is this is a just testament to me being 34 being on TikTok, but I was watching a TikTok the other day where someone had been like, um, you know, like, um, they, they talked about, it was like, I'm trying to think, I remember how they phrased it, but because they had learned in their, their formative years as a kid that everything was handed to them by their parents and they weren't always successful at things they'd done early on, then transitioning to an adult when you've got to push yourself and learn things that you aren't immediately you know successful or good at, is even harder because you know when you were younger things came so naturally to you oh 100 when... and i think like that, yeah. that gifted and talented cohort that i mentioned um i was in mm-hmm. high school um i don't know if that was like a benefit to me or a detriment because right yeah as you say like you you get used to being um you know the hard like work everything's handed well. to you yeah, everything, everything comes easy really, yeah and, and you also get used to the rewards as well, um, which right. I think I think I've managed to get rid of that, or I hope to. I like to think I've got rid of that in like my attitude, but um, right. certainly it can breed a sense of. Um, oh, I didn't. I don't know how to, how to say it. It's like not horrible, but yeah. like it, I, entitlement, or like you get used to re, like rewards and praise, and when you don't get it, you can be a bit like, oh, have I done something wrong? Yeah, I mean, like for me, it was mostly because I was an only child growing up. So. Oh, I mean, same. <laughs> 
Yeah, so what I was going to say is your parents probably paraded you with, you know, just praised your entire life and gave you everything you wanted. And then, I mean, that was definitely the case for me. And I feel like that is almost like there's a whole cartoon about it where it's like these parents, like, you know, painting these walls and putting these pretty pictures all over and like surrounding their kid with these walls. And then outside of it's like all this darkness and scariness. And it's like parents who do that, although they're doing it because they love you, of course, and they want to provide everything for you, they're almost setting up this fake world so that when you exist in the real world, you almost like don't function properly because you're not used to like, oh, I can't just get a job because I want it or people aren't just being nice to me because I'm me, you know. I like exist, I'm, yeah. I mean, I was yeah. quite fortunate, like my my parents, um, I'd say maybe once I hit like eight, nine years old, uh, I wasn't really that spoiled and I was a very independent child. Right. Um, they certainly did like reward me if I did well in school. Yeah. And that would... It was usually monetary, like if I got an A, I'd get like 50 quid. Um, and then I'd always, always <laughs> spend it on a gaming PC, always. I thought, That's why I still can't drive. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree that it, there's, there's hard lessons that have to be learned. And like, I'm, I'm yeah. still learning them now. Like, you know, yeah. like, there's still things in the last like few years, you know, I've been like rejected for things or maybe like, my art isn't hasn't been as good as I wanted it to be and I've been dealt like some quite harsh feedback and right. it it sucks and it, you never do quite get used to it and um yeah I think there are still times when me personally like I do it it stings and gets beneath the skin a bit and that's when you have to kind of take yourself away and rationalize it take yourself out of the, like, the emotional situation and uh-huh. then come back later but yeah I I wouldn't be I'm no psychologist but I wouldn't be surprised if yeah like a, an upbringing maybe like ours makes you have knee-jerk reactions like that a little bit more yeah I think it's the personal attack of like you know because you're not instantly good at something you're like oh well but I was always used to be good at this thing or like I could pick up these cells really easily when I was <laughs> younger but now I can't so but then is that something that stayed with you even in like your first job like when you went to 4j for example like were you still like very fresh in the mind of when you got feedback you were like almost recoiling in horror because something wasn't good enough or were like were you doing well where you were quite like you were separating that that personal feedback like it was just professional stuff I mean for your first job especially straight out of university it must have been intimidating right um it actually um I felt like I thrived in that position uh okay which I didn't expect because mm-hmm. uh, pixel art was never something that I'd like aimed for um there was uh, the first project that we ever did um I was Mm -hmm. uh partnered with a lady called Rebecca and we Mm -hmm. were we had to build the kelpies um in Minecraft by hand so we didn't have like any voxel software or anything that would generate it for us we had to like build it as if we were playing the game um okay you know the kelpies in Scotland right the the two horses heads I think they're in Scotland I, I, I I live in Falkirk so Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're on my doorstep. Okay, I, just, I just wanted to check. Um, but yeah, yeah, so that was when we first started doing them. Um, mm-hmm. That was maybe in the first two weeks of me working there. And I'd never really played Minecraft that much, really. Right. And yeah. it was like, how the hell do we build these like organic 3D flowing horses' heads out of right. cubes? Um, yeah. And yeah, so I'd say that was a real like. It was it was tough to not be getting the results that we wanted for probably about two or three weeks, um, right? But I wouldn't say that's like really representative of a normal game art pipeline. Like that was probably just more like an onboarding task. But uh, yeah. the job itself, yeah, I never really felt I, I got harsh criticism. Um, mm-hmm. It's probably be, been in the years since that I've, right. had, I've had to <laughs> for the system. But then was that something that? maybe your counter would be more going into coat sync because then that was uh like more traditional pipeline or more traditional game development yeah so yeah i had to learn a lot uh, about unity as well i never used unity um right their, their main engine uh, mm-hmm. so yeah there was a lot of learning and um i'd i'd been quite humbled i guess because um, i'd actually done a job for about 10 months prior that I hated it wasn't in games um mm-hmm. it was I was working for a web dev agency 
right. and uh, I'd gone in as QA and it, it was purely to like pay the bills while um, I was working on my portfolio. I'd actually just moved to Newcastle from Derby right. and um, yeah, they, they sent me to work, at, uh, I won't say which one, but a, gov- a government body um, as a scholar programmer. <laughs> it's like, I can't, so not only can I not like program in scholar, but I can't program at all. <laughs> So okay. <laughs> I left that and uh, thankfully got a job in coaching. Um, right. So I, I was quite like, I went in quite humbled, I think, because I'd had, I'd been so utterly miserable put in this job that, you know, I, I was actually sat there like literally not doing work all day because I I wasn't a programmer. Like I didn't even know what I was meant to be doing. Um, right. So I think I went into that job just like so happy to be there and just like, just teach me everything like no sense of ego, just wanted to sit and do 3D. Um, and then I think that started to change as I, I think I became, because a, a, I'm, I'm quite opinionated and um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's probably many words to describe me, but I, I think I like, I I kind of pushed my way up and I, I managed to get to like a senior position in probably about 18 months. Um, yeah. And that I think that's when more challenges when you've got more responsibility, um, that's mm-hmm. when the, the challenges uh, kind of show themselves. And then more so mm-hmm. as I then progress to lead. And actually the mm-hmm. step from senior to lead was probably one of the biggest ones. And the ones where you do face harsh criticism and you face consequences for actions that you'd kind of been protected from as like a junior or a senior. Right, yeah, because it's more expected of you at that level. Yeah, and you're, you know, you are responsible for the de- decisions that you make about the project and about the pipeline and about the people on your team. And right, um, and when I say co- you know, people have negative connotations with the word consequences. You know, consequences mm-hmm. can be good as well. I just mean like you, you just have to take ownership of the things you decide, no matter how they turn out. And that's right. a scary thing. So, yeah, well, I think indeed it's. I mean, you you talk about the whole like your opinion is like it's almost a negative thing but I think it's one of these things where you have to have a voice in this industry I think the more you have the voice then the more people will probably not only listen to you but will probably want to give you opportunities that are outside of your normal bearing so you know like you said you probably made that transition up to a lead position quite quickly because you were very talkative about your ideas and things you want to do within the company and maybe not specifically about changing the brands or changing the direction of the game but then you were very maybe vocal about ideas you had for it so I mean that is something I think that is almost I mean you can't teach that right that's something you're just born with where you know like I mean I'm like a chatty Cathy like I can I can just like like, talk the back legs of a horse I just I sometimes can never shut up but then it's gave me benefits to my career whereas in the fact that like I've been able to talk with a lot of the bigger artists because like I don't give a shit to an extent I will just message anybody and be like do you want to come on my podcast do you want to you know be my friend on Facebook that's not something that's ever stopped me it's all almost always just resulted in me being in a positive situation especially with the podcast but then I know there is a balancing act of it when you're in a studio as well because you can annoy people you know and piss them off but at the same time you don't want to be sat in a corner like a shadow where like nobody knows who you are right yeah and yeah it's like it's that fine line between being visible but not like not being obnoxious and being like too involved in in everything Um, yeah I think for me, the the biggest thing I had to learn to manage, which I don't know if I've really talked about publicly before, but is is my temper. Um, I'm a natural redhead and a scouser, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it can it it flares up now and again. Um, yeah. But yeah, like certainly when I was younger, um, probably early twenties, mm-hmm. if things, you know, obviously, the game dev never goes to plan, and um, mm-hmm. there are sometimes decisions made by other people that you're just like, why? And mm-hmm. I think during early on in my career, if I felt like myself or the art team was being impacted by decisions I ne- I probably wouldn't have chosen, um, mm-hmm. I would make sure that they knew, which wasn't always the best. It's not all, it's not always advisable. Um, and mm-hmm. yeah, when when I was leaving, actually, my my leaving card had a lot of like, "We'll miss your grumpy face. We'll we'll miss you mouthing off." <laughs> it's like, oh, wonderful. <laughs> What an impression I've made. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's something, going back to balancing acts, that's something I've personally wrestled with is um, when I do really strongly believe in something or I'm affronted by something or um, 
and this this kind of cropped up as when I had a team to manage as well you know I wanted to protect them mm. um I did always have this like internal wrestling of like okay I'm still in a professional workplace I can't go nuclear here <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll work out to 10 I'd imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah maybe, maybe get, go and get another coffee stuff up there. yeah yeah, on a little coffee, coffee makes you worse. Jesus, caffeine. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it is. It's definitely a thing where, like you said, as a, especially as a lead, right? And you're talking about a team where you want to have abilities to get your voice across because if people are being uh, mistreated or ignored or like you have opinions that are valid but people aren't just paying attention, you need that part of your brain that can switch on and be like, well, hold on a second, I'm getting a raw deal here. I really need to speak up and say something. But at the same time, like you say, not to a point where you're going to walk up to somebody who's like three levels above you and try to tell them what their job is. That's counterproductive to your career, the team and the whole company, to yeah, be fair. You don't want to get anyone's back up. Uh, and again, that's yeah. still something I think I'll always be learning how to navigate is how to approach. Because um, obviously in a creative industry, like it's everyone's baby and everyone has a night, like a vision in their head that, yeah. you know probably doesn't if you put everyone's vision if you plugged out their head and put them all in a row like they're probably all they'll be like Chinese whispers probably entirely different so yeah. you have to yeah. learn how to yeah just be incredibly diplomatic and not hurt anyone's feelings which is yeah. I think it also comes with age as well because you're probably I would imagine a lot younger than me I mean I'm in my 30s now but I definitely know that in my 20s, I was a completely different person. Like the way I approached situations or the way I thought about things was just like night and day to compare to like how I'd approach things now being 30, well, 34. So, um, but then I've had an entirely different career beforehand and I've switched careers. So like my journey is a wee bit different. But then I think when you were coming straight from university and working in uh, jobs early on as well, it's, it's probably just been a thing where you've just had to learn on the job. You've had to learn as you went. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because you know, if you look at your career and how it's trajected at the moment, you know, you've you've just it's went stellarly up and up and up since you've you've took on more and more challenges. So I think although you talk about it in a slightly negative way where you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I've got a temper and stuff, I think it definitely has served you well because like you said, even in the last year, the whole amount of opportunity you've been able to experience probably because you're so expo- outspoken or um would you call yourself an extrovert? No, I see I I definitely say introvert. Um, interesting yeah i I i'm very on my own terms when when i want to see people Uh, like i'd love going to the pub and seeing people and socializing but if someone was to turn up to my house i'd be like hmm why are you here (laughs) (laughs) yeah especially because you're usually getting your pages or something like oh god no (laughs) but um but yeah no but like it, it it's the same with me where i definitely enjoy my own space i enjoy working by myself at some points but i do i do need people around me to function like i think it is just almost an inherent part of being human at this point where like you just can't exist in a bubble and a vacuum on your own forever like you will just go stir crazy but um i do know that like i think in a sense i'm more 50 50 where i can't have my own time but at the same time if i need to be around people i can function as well i can't you know i'm not going to like cripple and, and crumble into a, a pile um because i have to go and talk to somebody like it, it can be done i can force myself to have a, an interaction but um, I think that's also partly what I've seen in this industry since I've joined as well is that there is, you know, twice as many introverts as there is extroverts. And I think almost people who are outspoken or people who have a louder voice in the industry are are more a rarity than most other industries, if you know what I mean. Like when I was an engineer, like everybody in my team, everybody who was part of our crew, like you would you would hear them before you saw them like right, that's okay. the kind of people i worked with whereas like people in this industry do you feel like it's the opposite or um yeah actually i think i mean i can obviously only speak about studios i've worked in and people i've been around yeah. but yeah i'd say overall there's normally like a handful of extroverts yeah. or maybe they're like extrovert introverts i wouldn't say there's yeah. many um you know people can pure... tell just like love being around yeah. people like and that's where their like energy and entertainment comes from um yeah and I certainly don't think like my friendship groups within games um yeah I think most people are kind of at least the ones I'm friends with are quite similar to me like like, mm. like their space like their quietness yeah like their time away from other but then when they've got to interact with people they can hold a conversation they can talk quite extensively about things when they need to so yeah I do feel like it's, it's again a balancing act but then so 
during your time uh, at Coat Sync, you've obviously took on a lot of work initially because, I mean, you're always taking on more work. Like you said, you're always trying to wade out your comfort zone into something a bit more exciting and a bit more dangerous. Where then did that whole boost in like personal work and then course, you know, making courses for flip normals, like, you know, like the last 12 months, was this something that like, did opportunities just keep getting thrown towards you or were you actively seeking those out or? So, yeah, I don't really know. Like it kind of did just happen. Um, so I I guess I could trace it back to um, when at Code Sync, uh, we were, because a lot of the games that we did were very, I mean, they were for like mobile VR, so really low like um, geometry and texture budgets and mm-hmm. um, quite quick turnarounds, maybe like a year, year and a half uh, mm-hmm. on projects. Um, so the art team started doing these, um, I think, was it weekly? Or, I think it was monthly. Yeah, it was monthly themes where it was like, because uh, that was it, we had weekly art meetings. Mm-hmm. where we would just kind of sit and chat about art or whatever. Like, didn't even have to be related to work. And we would right. set uh, these, like, monthly themes. And so I started using mine um, to uh, just kind of dig more into PBR. And it, it was never intended that I, you know, specialize in props. I just started doing little vignettes and little studies, mm-hmm. which then became me doing props. And then I started um, the Unreal Unreal scene that I've kind of been in and out of for maybe like two years now, um, right. which was the till. And um, that was actually, when I put that on Art Station, it was like quite well received. And that really took me by surprise because I just, I just hadn't anticipated, you know, people being excited about a till. <laughs> um, but then actually, I think I was, it, it was like, it was quite nice actually. Like I, I was in Portugal with with, with loads of friends from coaching. We'd just been in Portugal maybe twelve hours, and I right. just woke up. It's hot, thirty five degrees. Someone's making a sangria, and I had a, I had an email from Decagon, um, basically asking if I wanted to work with them. Okay. Um, so actually, I think that was actually maybe just after the coffee machine, or I was just making the coffee machine. Um, right. But yeah, then after that, it was um, it's kind of been like a little bit like one after another. Um, yeah, I I, I, mean, I haven't. I, I'm not a full time freelancer, so I don't actively look for freelance. But yeah. um, just people have got in touch if they've, you know, got a project that they think I'd be suited for. So yeah, that's nice. I think I think it's also one of these things where it's the Rolling Stone effect, where you know, as you start to gain momentum, as you post more things, just everything keeps piling on. People keep sending emails. You do work for them, then that comes out. Then again, it gathers a bit more momentum, and then Flip Normals gets in touch, and then that gathers momentum again. Like it, it, it just. It's a snowball effect is what I'm trying to say. The, yeah, the whole thing of like just getting bigger and bigger. But then was that something that moving towards your career now in Reflections, was that something that you have took a little less involvement in or do you feel that you're still as busy even though you're still working full time? Or My personal work has taken like a little bit of a hit. Um, right. But it's more because I've kind of, I think lockdown and a new job that, you know, as you say, I'm like, I'm learning so much. I'm only, I'm only three months in, um, yeah. constantly learning and I constantly feel challenged and it's like a, such a big studio that yeah. I'm constantly like touch with people and like talking mm-hmm. about things. So, yeah. um, it's a lot to take in in such a yeah, short space of time. So yeah, I, I've had like, there are some nights where I clock up and like, actually, yeah, I don't want to do, I don't want to set up this PC because obviously my, I'm using my personal PC to work from home as well. So I'm kind of, I would be at the yeah. same place. Um, yeah. But also, I've kind of just discovered a bit of a joy for other things. Like, my life had been purely 3D and art. So Because even before Decagon, I'd taken on, like, some small commissions for, like, uh, logo designs. And mm-hmm. um, I'd done some, like, branding for some companies, which is a, a side I don't really talk about. It's not, like, my obviously my main discipline. Um, but, yeah, my, my life had just been pure work. And, obviously, I was a lead at Coasting at this point. Um, but it had been pure work for about... 18 months um right I'd even like stopped uh doing like my aerial sports as much and uh, the plan actually was after leaving coaching I had a month off I was like gonna do all these things that went 3D but, but yeah so like now lockdown hit it's kind of evenings I've been like baking cake I've been doing all the stereotypical things like baking cakes and I've planted far too many tomatoes than I knew what to do with and <laughs> just like 
things that I didn't think I'd have an interest in. It's it's kind right. of given me that side of my life back a little bit more. Yeah. For now. Well, I mean, I think I, <laughs> yeah, because I think with me, especially initially with my career, I think the problem was I wanted to do everything. Like I think a lot of people do now is that there's so many, like so many careers now are open to people. You know, like, you know, uh, the fact that Unreal is now free, the fact that most learning software is free, Blender's free. There's so much free stuff out there that, you can almost train yourself to do anything at this point. Like if you picked a career, there's not a lot, there's not as many barriers in the way of people as there was previously. So I think for me, especially coming from initially, I wanted to be more 2D, so I wanted to do concept. Um, I just was trying to, I think almost force that because I wanted to do it, but then I eventually learned that like I don't draw like everybody else. Like I don't constantly fill a sketchbook every day. So 3D for me spoke to me a bit more because it was more of an immediate result. So I think it's almost a problem where people try to take on too much initially, but I think the the good thing you have now is that because you have established yourself in that field, you can now turn your hand to other things that are outside of your realm of understanding. So like you said, you can do more UI stuff. And you're, I mean, I looked at your UI stuff before we talked and I mean, the stuff you are doing UI wise is like as good as, you know, any professional UI des- designer. So, I mean, you've almost got like your hand in two careers at this point because you can do both quite well. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a thing where once you have established yourself, then you can look to other paths. Like what I'm trying to illustrate is that rather than take everything on at once, I think the main focus initially that I missed was that you really need to be specialised initially and then you can try and broaden horizons as you go on. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I did a talk at um, EGX in Mm -hmm. September just gone um, Mm -hmm. and the whole talk was about basically about this um how it's a little bit converse to what you're saying um but I was saying that you know you can a lot of people that go to uni or college or or even are self-taught have their like they've got their hearts set on these like huge companies like you know Blizzard, EA, Ubisoft etc and that can be quite hard to get into straight out of uni if you haven't specialized right and so I just basically talked about my career path, how I'd gone into um, indie studios and small studios as as a 3D artist, but more of a generalist or took on generalist roles while I was there. Um, and obviously how my career has kind of, I mean, it hasn't deviated too much, but it could have, you know, I, I was doing the UI while at CoSync, you know, I could have decided like, actually, no, this is, de- this is what I want to do. And then specialized further into UI. Um, right but yeah like so I'm agreeing with you in the sense that yeah you can you can change careers whenever you want but or you can diverge very slightly whenever you want you don't even have to work in games the rest of your life like I I was I was thinking I was talking to a friend we got a walk and I was like obviously a lot of people kind of leave games eventually um when they get older because obviously as you you can't do like the the long crunch and burn in the midnight oil you know when you're in your 40s and 50s anymore it's just it's not viable um and I was saying like I wouldn't be surprised if you know as I approach that age bracket if I you know start to look into stuff like product design or Mm -hmm. advertising you know using 3d like the hyper real stuff that you see used with like cosmetics and makeup and stuff um and yeah, I think it's just like being open to those opportunities. Like not everything is games and there's so much, or films really, like I think they're the two that everyone thinks of, but there's so much outside of that. There's like, you know, VR used for like training the military or, you know, in mm-hmm. Ikea or used on oil rigs. You know, you've got um, museums and heritage trust organizations that make use of 3D now, you know, to archive things. Um, right. Right got product visualization um there's there's the more like artsy side of it like you can be a, like a digital artist in the most traditional sense as in like you you know you rent gallery spaces and you have exhibits of 3d inspired art or whatever so there's, right. there's just there's so many paths from the medium that yeah, yeah i definitely wouldn't be i wouldn't restrict yourself to just be like i'm going to work at this four companies and that's it yeah i think it's because <sighs> People used to have jobs that were for life, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, back in back in the old days, when people were like, "I'm going to go work down a mine shaft until I die," that was like your whole set path. But now, because the world is so interconnected and so joined and so educated, people can like work in an industry for ten years and be like, "Cool, I've had enough of that. Let's do something else." <laughs> so, like, I mean, I've done it. I, I was an engineer yeah. from eighteen 
18 to 28 for 10 years of my life, I worked fixing telephones and data switches. But then I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, that was also combined that fact that I fucking hated the people I worked with in my job. But also, I just wanted to change and I wanted to better myself and, and you know, like go to uni and, and do the things I wish I had done. And then I did it. And then great, the things hanging on my wall and I'm working here now. But then, yeah, like you said, 10 years from now, where do you go? And I think it was more evident when you see a lot of the, what I call the old guards. So people who were game developers in the 90s, you know, like the original people who founded Rockstar and DMA or, you know, like that whole, I don't know if you watched the recent documentary about Creative Assembly that Noclip done. Um, it was really well done, actually, because Creative Assembly is probably one of the biggest, um, you know, games developers in, 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 well, in the country especially. But, um, but they've done a whole documentary about, like their former CEO and of what he's done now and how he like basically left. He sold the company and he, he lives in Italy. Basically, I think as far as I know, enjoying the sunshine. But oh, that would be my know. dream actually. Yeah. <laughs> Live in the Mediterranean, love it. Yeah, well, he was. He was. They were looking at the view, and I'll, I'll send. I'll send you the link later. It's a really good video to watch. But um, but they were. He was looking at the view, and he was like, "Oh yeah, thanks to Sega for this because uh, they, you know, they must have purchased the company often for millions." But um, he talks about extensively about you know Tim. He talks about how. For 18 years of his life, that was that was his whole life. And he talks about it because, especially because at the level he was at, you know, he basically neglected his wife and kids. He had no life outside his work. You know, when he left, he just, like, for almost a year, didn't know what to do with himself. He was constantly checking his email and nobody was getting in touch. You know, he had nothing to do day to day. So I think for a lot of these companies, when they were originally founded, because it was like the early days of Silicon Valley, people identified their entire personality with this company and this whole way of life but then i think like you said you have to understand sometimes as an artist even at the highest level there's a life outside of your work you know you are now at almost well you are at the tip of your top of game development and one of the biggest studios on the planet so you know but then again you go home you bake cakes you take walks you know you draw ui for other projects so i think it's being able to say to yourself that it's great that you put this effort into this one path of your life but it's not it doesn't have to be everything you do, right? It doesn't have to be your whole life. Oh, totally. Yeah, because, yeah, it's it's a funny one because I absolutely love my job. But then there are times where I have to be like, what is a job for? Is it is it what you were put on this planet for? Or is it to pay the yeah. bills? You know? Yeah, right, yeah. Well, again, I think that's like the old saying that somebody had put in a, some Facebook cartoon or something, but it was like, you know, you weren't meant to pay taxes and die. That wasn't your intention. <laughs> well, that's a, a very brutalist way. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but very true. Like it is, I mean, people, I think, lose sight of that. And I know coming from a family where I've had, you know, a dad who was a workaholic most of his life, is, and I never got to see him because of that, it is something, you know, me and Jan talked about this in an interview as well, where Jan was like, now taking a very conscious decision that he wants to separate his working life because you know he wants to see his kids he wants to have a family and he doesn't want to be absent from that um and i think it's also one of these things where like you said you have to try and think about your life outside of your work you have to have some kind of balance because then when you come back to your work you don't want to be so burnt out that you just can't do anything because you've done so much of it already there needs to be a um a 50 50 split in, in in what you're doing so yeah it is hard to transition like i remember um so after I left Code Sync, I had a month off and that was when I used most of that to do uh, freelance work, but also the Flip Normals tutorial. But I was still pretty much working like full work days and extra um, in that point. Right. Um, and then when I started at Ubisoft, um, I obviously like ceased uh, freelance work for a while um, mm -hmm. to, you know, I had a lot to learn and I didn't want to be dealing with like clients and deadlines on top of remotely on overburdened yeah right when the uk had gone into lockdown so um yeah. i forgot what i was gonna say i had a yeah, point to make that of <laughs> course but yeah, not... I, I remembered um but yeah i really struggled at first um maybe in the first month uh, when i would clock off and mm -hmm. I knew that i needed to relax or you know keep up with my yoga because obviously my studio uh, like the yoga studio, obviously they weren't open. I didn't want to lose mm -hmm. all that. And I, I knew that I should be doing things, productive things. And I ended up just moping around the house because I was so used to, um, at coasting, like I would finish at five, half five, get the Metro home, be home for six, mm -hmm. maybe like quickly eat something, log on and then work till midnight, one, 2 AM, rinse and repeat every day. Um, and then suddenly having that like a vacuum in my evenings, I just didn't know what to do with it. It was it was more stressful 
because I felt like I, I was just, I was wasting this finite time that I have. Well, I mean, it's interesting you brought that up as well, because, you know, I would have said sometimes I fill that void with video games, but then we had this talk beforehand about you've almost, well, you have, you've given up playing games almost entirely because your work was so involving. Um, is that something you think you would like ever go back to, or do you feel like that's something that's just like dead to you at this point? Or um, Some games hook me. Uh, so... I got Ellie Noir on my Switch. So, okay, yeah, Animal Crossing. Yeah, I've been on, mm-hmm. I have been on Animal Crossing. Um, that's yeah. been more like, it's been a bit like a phone game, though, isn't it? Like, you kind of check it in the morning and that's that. Yeah. Um, but I got Ellie, Ellie Noir on my Switch because I'd never played it when it came out. Um, and that, you play it in VR, it's so good. <laughs> that really hooked me. And I think, yeah. like, one Sunday, I was a little bit hungover and I just lay in bed playing Ellie Noir from about 9 a.m. till about 11 p.m. <laughs> I'm only getting up to eat. I, honestly, it was. I was like, I should be less than my late twenties. What, what am I doing? Yeah, um, yeah. But see, there are games that sometimes still hook me, like Persona Five. Um, I love. Oh, I need to play that one. Play it so bad. But yeah, I when I hear people talk about game and announcements, there isn't that part of me mm-hmm. anymore. That's like super, super excited, and I do miss it. But that's not to say, yeah. I don't make this disclaimer. Like, any game I'm working on, I will always treasure. Mm-hmm. Like, I think work on a game yeah. is very, very different to play playing it. it. Yeah, like, I, I yeah. even if it's a game, like, I wouldn't necessarily play, I still, like, 100% take ownership of it, and it becomes precious to me in a different way than, you know, Guild Wars was precious to me when I was a teenager. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, as as your career progresses and your age changes, that I think it's it's just it's paying attention to things that maybe resonate with you more. So like when you're younger, you probably play everything and anything because you're just desperate to play something new. But then when you get older, I think there's certain things that you find are more unique to your personality or things that like you pick up that you're interested in. I mean, from, I mean, I haven't really enjoyed the game for a while either. Like it's been, I think the last thing that really gripped me was um, Breath of the Wild because I'm a huge Zelda nerd and have been since I was five. I was like the first ever game I played when I was five years old was Legend of Zelda. Um, so for me, Breath of the Wild was like not only the best Zelda game I played, but one of the best games I'd ever played. So that like just, you know, I think for maybe only two weeks straight, I'd never put my Switch down. I was so enamored with it. Um, and I haven't really felt that way much games. I think maybe because I, this is a whole different subject, but I feel like sometimes modern games don't have a whole lot to say or aren't just as involved as they used to be. Whereas recently we were talking before we started recording, like um, I've been hooked in Death Stranding. Like I think, especially with Kojima, it's like his storytelling always resonates with me. And I think that's the thing that you develop as you get older is that there's certain developers or certain storytellers where you look forward to what they release because you're, uh, enamored with those worlds but then you're not going to play every single shooter or a uh, mobile or thing that comes out because you know you're looking for unique experiences you're looking for things that are more atoned to your time in your life so i think at the moment a lot of my stuff is single player offline storytelling driven like that's the stuff you know like last of us that kind of stuff like that's the stuff that now resonates with me because you know i don't have like with online games, I don't have like weeks and months and years to get good at them or, you know, hours and hours per week to sink into it to progress. Um, although Animal Crossing, I think, is almost like crack cocaine at this point. Um, I have been trying to pull the switch away from my girlfriend at points and she's been shouting at me. Um, but yeah, like I think it is a thing where you change just your tastes. Is that probably the simplest way to put it? I don't know if it's tastes. I think I have the same tastes as I did. Um, it's, I think it's just... I don't think it's the game's fault either. I think it is me. I think I have such a low attention threshold now that um, the minute a game is difficult in an unpleasant way, mm-hmm. I just, I turn it off. Like, I just get right. instant, like, I don't want to play this. And actually, I'd probably be a really good candidate for level designers who are, like, testing, like, world comfort stuff. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> the, the minute something inconveniences me, I'm like, oh, I don't want to play it. Um, yeah, I don't want to play it. But... But going back to that, like, similarly with your you were saying about narrative experience, like I'd say the last console game that, um, yeah, really really hooked me, and I think I just binged on it was um, Detroit Become Human. Um, I think oh, okay. like that was a little bit I wouldn't say controversial, but some people were like, "Oh, it's not a proper game." But I think at at the point in time that I played it, I needed that. I needed like beautiful three D worlds to mm-hmm. satisfy the artist in me. Yeah. Um, a really good 
narrative and characters mm -hmm. and then just uh, mechanics that I could just hit X and square occasionally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I think that. I was going to say that because I used to like I used to dig playing a lot of the Telltale games like the Walking Dead series and then like Wolf Among Us was one of my favorites because it was like watching a movie to an extent or a TV series but you got to pick and choose what happened so I think that was something also that fed that part of me that I liked as well so yeah I think it's definitely picking things that I think um feed on um I'm trying to think, yeah, I'm trying to think of how you word it basically, but I think, like it says, it has come down to certain things with taste and time and worlds you want to explore. Also. Yeah, like, like Persona as well. Like, I've never really played Persona, but I know I want to because every time I look at that game, my friend has it on PS4, and uh, every time she's walking about, like, it looks like Tokyo, and I love Japan, so I'm like, yeah, well, I would love to walk about because I've heard it's a really good depiction of Tokyo, so it's quite um, surreal as well. So, I, I, I quite like surreal things or like things with a bit of like conspiratorial or mysterious yeah. slash overtones what you want to describe I, th I think also for my, my for my taste as well I think what I need to try and start doing is playing games away from a computer because at the moment I think I'm kind of like you where in essence you know my computer I use for my 3D stuff is also where my games live so I think that's almost an important step for a lot of people is that you need to separate those two lives because then you're just like never getting up for your chair. And then that is like dangerous because it's hard to sit and, you know, work all day on a computer doing 3D stuff and then sit and play games on it in a chair as well. Cause you just, you're never walking, you're never getting up. And that's where I found my transition was hardest when I changed careers because I would work all day lifting and shifting and, you know, doing some well, heavy work that would make me sweat and I'd get an exercise. But then I'd come home and sit on a couch and play games. But now. I felt like you earned it, I guess, at that point. Cause it was. So yeah. Definitely, but then now, of course, I'm doing stuff on the computer, and then at night, I'm doing stuff on the computer, and then I'm doing stuff on the computer. You know what I mean? Like it never stops. I think I just so. need a really good RPG on the Switch because I, when I bought, I obviously bought the Switch for Animal Crossing maybe mm -hmm. about two months ago, um, mm -hmm. and I kind of had this idea because I I always played uh, Game Boy Advance and DS mm -hmm. as a kid, and I would like mm -hmm. I had one of those like. Uh, there's Ikea chairs that everyone has and I would sit with my Game Boy plugged into the wall and I would just play like Golden Sun or something all day and I was yeah. looking throughout the Nintendo Switch store for an RPG like none of them seemed like they'd scratch that itch but I think if I found something that was a proper like old school JRPG then mm. maybe maybe I can go back to like gaming in an evening as well. I mean, there's like this is where I'm a nerd for this because I, I grew up playing RPGs like Final Fantasy and stuff. But um, there's a handful I would say on the Switch are really good, um, especially for Animal Crossing. I would say Stardew Valley is a really good one to get into. Uh, because so it's many about... people have recommended it to me, and I just yeah. I well, I mean, it's, you're maintaining a farm and stuff. Like it's quite it's quite relaxing in itself. It's like Animal Crossing; you just do a little bit every day. Um, but then the more hardcore stuff is like, well, Breath of the Wild, of course, like that is like one of the ultimates. Um, Altopath Traveler, Xenoblade Chronicles, Pokemon. Xenoblade, I was thinking about because I think that seems to be the closest to what I'm looking for. But yeah, I mean, well, there's that, and then there's like Pokemon Dragon Quest and Fire Emblem, and then Paper Mario just came out. So like, there's a couple ones within that you probably could dive into. I mean, Paper Mario is getting really good reviews, and I know that is a really good, like, fun, almost cute look because it's, it's the Origami King, so it's all about paper folding. So it might, it might appeal to your craft side as well. So, oh no, I don't uh, do crafts. I do fine oh, okay. art, not crafts. I, I ah. everyone laughs at me because I'm like, for an artist, I am the least dexterous person in the world. <laughs> like, if my like earrings get tangled up, I'm like, oh, I've been them. They're, they're done now. <laughs> I'm, impossible. I'm not dealing with it. That's it. It's done. It's dead. <laughs> yeah. Like, so. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a crafty person at all. I'm. I'm sure oh. it looks very pretty, but I think it's finding the craft that is for you. Because I know that people like you're like, oh, I'm no, I don't want to do scrapbook and I don't want to do that. Like people like getting a clay or something. Like you just got to yeah, find yeah, the I love thing. That. Actually, I used to go to life drawing classes that there were, but you modeled with clay. So oh, yeah, life modeling classes, I suppose. I think that's also important. I think is that I mean, I read one of Brené Brown's books, and it was like eye opening to me. She's such an incredible psychologist, but like she talked about the the essence of play, and for most adults, what play actually needs to be is something that has no achievable results. So, so like, well, if you model with clay, you don't you're not, you're not modeling to learn something to become an industry artist. You're just doing it because it's for fun. I think you that's I mean? like I see a lot of discourse on Twitter about this, like 
we, mm-hmm. our generation and probably the generation beneath us, we've mm-hmm. been taught that like everything we do needs to be like monetized or, you know, bring us some sort of financial benefit. Nothing right. for, like fun anymore. And I, yeah. when I used to do, so obviously like my art obviously is incentivized, uh, sorry, monetized. Um, mm-hmm. But I, when I used to do like my aerial training, like uh, aerial yoga and pole and hoop and stuff, uh, that yeah. very much started as something fun. Now, this is completely unrelated to art, but um, mm-hmm. it started as something but fun and to like keep fit. And then after maybe mm-hmm. like two, three years of doing it, obviously I'd got to a level that was pretty advanced. Uh, right. And I was, I was quite strong and, you know, I was doing a lot of flips and tricks and um, I started to feel a lot of pressure from the people around me. And I don't think they, they didn't mean it as a bad thing, but mm-hmm. I think it was quite harmful. Like looking back, I think it was quite harmful to like my mental health. There was a lot of pressure to um, perform and, you know, compete oh, as well. Right. And right. the competitions um, are probably quite similar to any dance competitions they're like they are brutal like you have to like gymnastics you have to train you have to break yourself you have to yeah uh, and diet and exercise diet, yeah, and... Exercise and, you, and then spend like 200 pound on a really glittery costume or, oh or, god yeah um and for a while i could kind of deflect it and be like no no i'm just here because i like being like strong and flexible and you know i'm here right it's, it's not all. and then you know i could only really keep that up for so long and then mm-hmm. Um, I think I did end up like competing. No, I didn't do like any nationwide uh, competitions, right. just like little local ones. Um, and I didn't enjoy yeah. them. But mm-hmm. then there was like more pressure. And then there was like a lot of people oh. in my studio that was that was doing the competitions. And it was almost like, oh, well, why aren't you doing it, Hannah? And then I started to believe that, you know, I wasn't, I'm, I, I've got all this like, um, I wouldn't say talent is the wrong word, but like I've, I've trained for all these years and, you know, maybe I am in the wrong because I'm not competing with all these people. Like maybe this is wrong Aww. with me and I'm wasting it. And yeah, it is a, it's a, it's a horrible like mindset to be in. And I think it is quite endemic to like our generation. So just yeah. not have that sense of play or, or for people yeah. to not see the value in it as much. Yeah, I think it was interesting to me as well, where especially younger, I was very, I mean, now like my weight is ridiculous. I just, I hate looking in the mirror, but when I was younger, like my early twenties, like I was very physically fit and it was mostly because I'd done martial arts, like extensively throughout my young career. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I got into my early twenties, I found Muay Thai. So I was doing uh, Thai kickboxing and at the initial phase, the first three years when I was training, I really loved it because the guy who trained us was a cop and he was like basically just training. He, he almost treated it like a, a keep fit class with fighting. Um, but then as soon as he left, because he just didn't have the time to do it anymore, the guy who took over um, was basically, he started to train people to fight. And I was like, I don't want to compete. I don't want to go in and beat the shit out of people. That's not what I'm here for. Okay. I, want to, I want to keep fit. I want to learn a little bit of self-defense that's it i don't want to do anything and then but he was like oh no you're like you'll be expected to compete at one point if you want to get i was like oh no that was you know like say that's when the fun starts to just like get sucked from the whole thing because you're like i don't want to i don't want to expectations yeah basically because he was like oh well you know you're at this certain level now like i had like the rope with my arm that was a certain color um and he was like yeah you know you'll be expected especially now because you're like a senior after three years um yeah you should be you should be competing you should be going to local uh, fights and stuff i was like i don't i don't want even that especially with like muay thai like i I, i'm such a pacifist at times i don't want to fight people i was like even like at most times i'll avoid a fight at all costs out in the street but like i don't want to walk into a ring purposely go knock the shit out of something that's not what i want to do so he was like oh yeah well you know this class is and then he had at one point he had people kicking like little like walls to train their shins and i was like at that point i was like I'm so that sounds like it would absolutely ruin your joints that yeah i mean i'm not a physiotherapist or whatever but that's i mean like <laughs> there's ways you can build up to it so a lot of those guys basically when they kick with their shins are like deadly weapons but if that's not your MO, then like, yeah, you're just not going to enjoy it because it, it's so much training. It's like it, it's like going from like a fun pastime activity to like killing people, and I just didn't want to take that leap. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, jump when you put it like that. No, I know, I know. But then, like, yeah, like you said, it's good when there's no. I think even arts to you know, for me, when I talk to a lot of people about art and expectations, one of my friends who I met at Axis when I was interning there, like he's now working at Blur Studios, but uh, when Javier was working there. He used to keep a sketchbook or just like loose bits of paper where he sketched like um like Zelda, like Link stuff and like superheroes and Batman. 
but it was it wasn't for the like they were he was working on destiny 2 at the time but like they were making 3d models and stuff but he was doing the stuff like the stuff in the paper was just for him he didn't show it to anybody it wasn't something he put on his art station like it was literally just he loved doing comics about superheroes and that was like his thing he had from like you know when he was four but then when he carried it in his adulthood like he's like oh well my 3d artist like that's my day job but like the stuff i do here this is for, just for me and i think that's almost like i felt so jealous because it was so freeing like he had such a an amazing hobby that was just for him he didn't have to show it to the world i mean now like he's he's posting stuff on his instagram constantly it's all his drawings but i just love the fact that he there was no expectations for his drawing and i think that's where that's why he fry thrives so much of it as as well as in his 3d because there was no expectation you know what i mean yeah i always say that about my digital paintings so like i'm kind of similar i've got an instagram where i just like dump my paintings i haven't done any in a couple of months but um, right yeah, like I don't, obviously I was trained in college to, to like paint and stuff and I did it a little right. bit throughout uni and I have done like, mm-hmm. so, I have done some fundamentals, but yeah, I pretty much just like paint for me and if it's, I put it on Instagram more of like a blog for myself and if people want to follow it, they can follow it. Um, obviously right. I always appreciate feedback, but I'm not training to be a painter or an illustrator I have no desire to be it's just I I I see like mundane things when I'm out on a boat and think oh I might paint that make it a little bit colorful or like my for about a year um after I so I obviously I obviously mentioned before I love Mediterranean I love I love Greece um Mm -hmm. and for about a year and a half I just painted from photos that I'd taken in um various Greek holidays I'd been on and that was like super relaxing to me because it was obviously looking at reference of a place that I love and have fun memories of. And then I was just painting it for me and I would just sit on my iPad and tune out. And I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, measuring myself to anyone. I wasn't trying to paint something. Yeah. That will, you know, become a print or go in some art book or something. Um, right. And yeah, yeah, I totally agree. It is quite it's quite nice to do that like supplementary activity. Yeah, definitely. I feel like it's one of these things where the more people have these expectations of you, then the more pressure's put on, then the less you want to do things. Like it almost like you says it ruins it where, you know, especially if you're I think when people like seek out questions and answers really early on, it's almost like a detriment to them. You know, when like if you're just starting a three D R and you're constantly, you know, speaking to people like what should I be doing you know like if you ask like three four people in the industry everyone's going to give you a different answer like oh you know learn blender learn this learn that or you really should be looking at you know I think so much of the early career and a lot of your early art career should be you finding your own way and making your own path because the thing like I've talked about this before I've interviewed 50 odd people over the last couple of years and whenever I talk about or ask the question how did you get into the industry every single person has a different answer to that question yeah and it's it's maybe like a slightly I don't know unfriendly slash controversial thing to say but I actually really don't like it when people message me out the blue being like oh I really fancy being a 3d artist how do I do it because I'm like do you it's such a well first it's such a really open-ended question and I'm really busy yes but, I can answer that in one part exactly, of but also you know do you actually do you want to be a 3D artist or do you just like the sound of it because right. I feel like as you say it's better if, if if you start to be interested in something and think like hmm yeah I, I fancy you know finding out more about that or maybe mm. giving it a go like mm-hmm. just start googling just start reading random stuff like mm-hmm. I I feel like just kind of sending out blanket emails and yeah, as you were saying, like asking like four or five, 10, 20, whatever artists, like, how do Mm -hmm. I do it? Mm -hmm. It doesn't teach you to teach yourself and you never, you're going to get different answers and you, they might conflict and they might end up just like confusing you more because people are, you know, going to mention all this different, obviously 3d artists have different software. So you're going to get all these things said to you. And I think that's, it sounds like I'm being super ne- super negative. Like I'm not saying don't ask, no, no, no. Don't ask for guidance. Being honest, but, being honest. Yeah. Um, it's better to you you know do a bit of research and reading yourself and really think about what you want to be before you start. You know, being like, how do I do 3D? Yeah, I think it's especially maybe my fault when I was you know, even like a couple of years ago when I was first starting in the industry where. I would generally talk to people because that was what I'd done previously in my work. You know, like if I had a question at my work, I would ask somebody, 
a question and then hopefully get a response. But then with a lot of these guys in the industry, it's like you said, you know, if you ask a Max user how to use 3D, he's going to, you know, use his 3D, his 3D Max pipeline as someone who uses Blender, someone who uses Maya, whatever. Also, different you know what I mean? like, jobs, you know, the software, the yeah. character artists still use that I won't. There's, um, mm-hmm. you know, VFX people are all going to be using like um, Redshift and Ray Tracing and yeah. stuff like that. Like, yeah. it's the term 3D is so broad that you, re, you know, it would be like, it's almost like asking how do I be an artist, you know? You yeah, just have, to, something you you just have to poke your toe in and, and see where it gets you. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's that's a good way to end this as well, but then I think it's just a, a general life lesson is that, yeah, you have to forge your own path and, and these, these podcasts can do a lot for you for just, you know, general advice and, and finding your way, but ultimately the journey is yours and we can you know you know you can lead a horse to water you can't make it drink it so you know we can show you the way but you have to make the the journey yourself Mm -hmm. so um so yeah so yeah i'll I'll not keep you too long because of course i know you you want to try and relax at one point (laughs) as as well and get back to your life but um i just wanted to say thank you quickly for coming on again it was real honor and a privilege talking to you thank you so much for inviting me it's probably one of the longest podcasts i've done it's been nice yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, actually, I think it's one of the, just the testaments to sometimes how long I've done this now. But I tend to talk to people, and then I get to like, okay, we're done, and the folk are like, Jesus, it's been an hour. Like, it's, <laughs> it's just it flies in sometimes. But then I think it's also when people talk about about the industry with as much passion as we do, you've got, like, you know, you know yourself, you could sit on a stage for four hours and talk about this because there's just there's oh, so yeah. much. I have to like remind myself not to talk the ears off my friends when I'm at the pub because if I've had <laughs> like a couple of drinks and something exciting has happened with my like, yeah. personal work or something, I'll just, I'll just go on about it for hours yeah. and they'll be like, Hannah, we're trying to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> But that's also why you are where you are, Hannah, because of the the passion and the excitement you have in your voice. Even I can sense it, like it is, you know. And like I say, you were one of one of the the highest requested artists that we had on uh, in the polls. Like people were really, really wanting you to come on. Oh, so that's insane. I mean, it's like yeah, a podcast of me rambling on about like not even hot stuff. No, <laughs> I know, but then I, yeah, but you've, you've had a very. I think it's definitely it's even a bit of therapy just talking about the issues and problems you have. It's probably fine that there's a lot of people in the industry that are just like you who are having the same fears and thoughts and i think as well as people at the high ends of it like you and AAA, if you've got the same experiences then it makes them feel a bit more human a bit more capable to go on and push on because they know you've been through it too so mm-hmm. uh, i think it's why it's good to have these so yeah anyway um thanks for listening guys if you made it to the end i really appreciate it um yeah just check us out on all the platforms we're on nearly every uh, social and media platform every podcast platform spotify itunes google podcast the whole list um we also have a youtube version if you're listening online um where we'll have video accompaniments we'll have some of hannah's work up um and uh yeah that's really just it uh, again thanks to hannah for coming on thanks to you guys for listening and uh we'll see you in the next episode stay tuned we've got a really uh, great assortment of guests coming on and uh we'll speak to you later bye guys bye